All right, so the topic of my uh, talk today is uh, what I call as human-centered machine intelligence. By that broadly, what I mean is uh, uh, refers to engineering methods and technologies uh, one that focuses on understanding the human condition, you know, we'll unpack that in this talk a little bit more. And then also trying to create, based on that understanding, uh, create technologies that will support and enhance human experiences. You know, uh, simple example you can think about, right? being able to use voice to uh, communicate with, uh, uh, you know, and, and control devices or uh, health analytics, a lot of different things to support decision making by clinicians and so on. Right. In particular, when we talk about the human centered view, uh, it kind of, you know, at, uh, primarily sort of, you know, at, at the core, it involves characterizing data and information about people, from people, and for people, and providing information, including, it includes sort of, you know, knowledge about how people use information, right, how we process, perceive, uh, uh, judge, and, 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 and use human data, right? For example, you can think about a simple example of machine learning is like, you know, we use human-derived annotations as a way to either build models, test models, and eventually use models, right? So this is sort of the broad view of uh, uh, the, uh, this particular talk uh, backdrop. Uh, so a couple of things that are making this uh, very exciting uh, lately, right? One, there's a convergence in the advances that are happening across the ecosystem of what we call as machine intelligence. So you may know that I'm using the term machine intelligence and AI uh, to refer to this uh, broader view of not just uh, methods that uh, are at the level of sort of inference and decision making and you know and planning and so on, but everything that goes from you know observing the uh, people in the world to analyzing and processing this data, interpreting you know inference. And also sort of deciding, you know, how to respond and, and responding, right? This whole ecosystem I call this machine intelligence ecosystem. So there's this conversion that's happening in, you know, how we can sense people in their world in computing both sort of, you know, on devices and uh, on the cloud and, you know, on the edge and so on. Machine learning advances, you know, happening algorithm, the algorithms, you know, the optimization techniques and the new ways of uh, uh mapping data to constructs that help us sort of uh, uh, either understand, synthesize, or or, uh, or manipulate information. And of course, uh, you know, data communication and interfaces uh, or devices on people. So there's this convergence of technologies that's happening on the one hand. There's also something that's happening at the sort of, you know, social, uh, technical human level. A lot of pro uh, partnerships that are happening across disciplines, you know, when we are talking about something that is very human-centered, right? It's not just computer science or engineering, uh, but uh, uh, brings knowledge about people from various domains, whether it is, you know, uh, behavioral sciences, you know, linguistic psychology or application domains, whether it is, you know, in, in medicine or uh, uh, social sciences and, and so on. So there's lots of uh, partnerships and, uh, you know, uh, collaborations that are happening, especially in sharing resources, data and knowledge, right? So. So this is made you know, possible for uh, you know uh, people working in this broad area of computer science and especially you know with this you know, uh, uh, resurgence of AI uh, to create possibilities to understand, support, and enhance this human experience. And so what I'm going to do today is to give you some examples. It's a more um, applied sort of uh, uh, application centric uh, uh, presentation just to sort of you know share some possibilities and maybe even inspire some uh, some of you to pick up some of these ideas and make it even better. Uh, so as an example of this human-centered machine intelligence, let's take, you know, uh, understanding uh, human interaction, right? Seems very simple, you know, we, we do this all the time. Um, it, it's very multimodal. We use various signals to exchange information and, you know, and, and together sort of, you know, uh, do things. Uh, for example, you know, in this particular video clip, I'm gonna show you a parent and a child making a story together, right? Uh, and in the inset, you'll see, you know, the very familiar audio signal and some um, aspects, uh, indications of automatic processing. Uh, here's the uh, uh, wristband signal, you know, ba basically uh, what, what is called electrodermal activity gives you some indication of physiological arousal state, right, uh, of both of people. So let me uh, play this. And then he got stung <laughs> by bees. 
So as you can see, right, it was very, you know, a, very, a snippet of an interaction, but the rich verbal, nonverbal behavior, you know, that we can, you know, uh, listen to, uh, uh, see, uh, provides us access to the intent emotions, both for the people who are participating in the interaction, but also observers. But also, you know, if you have access to other information like physiological information or even neural signals, right, you know, increasingly we can bring a rich understanding of what is happening in this interaction, not only about you know, uh, the person's, uh, uh, who they are, what are they saying, how are they interacting, but also other aspects like, you know, uh, their uh, yeah, affective states, right? Now they were laughing and, uh, you know, having uh, fun together, you know, what's so-called uh, shared enjoyment and, and so on. So the, these are various questions that, you know, increasingly what is often done um, by human observation and mapping can be brought to bear through sort of tools and methodologies that we can create with this machine intelligence ecosystem, right? So one of the important things we need to underscore while trying to do this is that because you know every uh, person is unique and have their rich context, right? The technologies that we try to create, right, should work for everyone in all contexts. This is sort of almost like a necessary sort of requirement as we design, not as an afterthought. So in understanding and creating experiences in who, what, where, how, when, right? There's so much rich variety. So one of the things that Credo in, in, in this machine intelligence, you know, human-centered machine intelligence is both understanding this variability you know, of interest, for example, uh, through say their vocal signals or their uh, visual behavior, uh, say affective state, that's a variability in the signal that we are trying to target and map. But at the same time, we wanna know regardless of who they are, for example, or where they are, say this is a child versus a, a grown up, or they are in a, a social circumstance versus sort of in a, in a business circumstance, we wanna make sure we understand. So both this, Understanding and addressing the variability is always, at, you know, concurrent goals. Uh, and so, this is just a summary slide of you know the broad, you know, uh, uh, goals of the human-centered machine intelligence. Right, one, you know, a lot of these things, as I said, right, uh, you know, in current day practice in many domains are done with human expertise, humans acting as the for people who analyze and map and use this uh, data and signals, human intelligence, if you may. But perhaps we can bring machine intelligence to do that, you know, to emulate that, but perhaps with more efficiency, scale, consistency, and so on, right? The obvious thing we can do. The other thing that's exciting is, you know, things that we are not able to do with uh, just human, uh, you know, perception and cognition, you know, creating tools to offer insights for, for scientific discovery about, for example, intricate patterns uh, in uh, you know, uh, signals of how we regulate stress or emotions, you know, or how uh, when two people interact, they sort of, you know, uh, coordinate their actions, you know, uh, both behaviorally, but also maybe even physiologically and neurally. And finally, the, 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 the thing that excites me personally most is how can we translate these ideas from scientific ideas we, we can create using machine intelligence to create new tools for diagnostics and you know uh, supporting sort of interventions and so on, especially in the health domain. So I'm going to draw a lot of examples from the uh, health domain in, in this talk. So I'm going to touch up on three sort of you know application broad application area to illustrate you know uh, the broad set of possibilities for human machine intelligence. One in basics, you know, speech science, you know, uh, speech and language science, you know, just uh, as a bookend. And then I'll talk about a little bit more about you know, uh, uh, some work in, uh, in, in, in media work in bringing human-centered AI to provide from a social scientific perspective insights about things that are not typically done with uh, these kinds of machine intelligence tools. But the bulk of my uh, presentation will focus on the middle thing, the behavioral machine intelligence, uh, things that are focused on human trait and mental state, especially from mental health as an application to me. Right. So very quickly, you know, um, you know, there's a long history. People who've been interested in, you know, uh, you know, sp speech as we know, right, has has, a, has been a, 
a big application area for AI, you know, right? Speech recognition, uh, a lot of these uh, conversational agent design and so on. Uh, but behind that is the long history of work in speech, uh, especially in speech science. So one of the questions that we've been asking is how can we bring machine intelligence technologies to support scientific inquiry? Um, so the convergence of sensing and uh, and processing and modeling that I talked about, right? Now it's in the service of both science and hopefully you know, translating it to clinical applications, such as, for example, neurological disorder. So simply, right, one of the things that we've been doing is like with this convergence that's happening is sort of... Uh, uh, um, We've been developing imaging and other multimodal sensing technologies, for example, being able to actually see people when they are uh, speaking by imaging them using MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, uh, when the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism. They act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. So we are able to have access to very rich multimodal data here, you know, your audio video, with which right now we can bring all the sort of processing and machine learning and modeling ideas to think about, for example, questions about biometrics. Each of us is given a different vocal instrument with which we produce speech and, you know, and, and, and lang spoken language. How does it impact? You know, what are the things common across languages? What happens when some of these systems are uh, challenged by, say, disease, you know, uh, uh, like cancer and so on? I wanted to illustrate uh, one of the recent databases that we, you know, it's a, one of the largest of this kind, has, you know, two D videos and three D uh, volumetric images, audio, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from several people. Now people, you know, now we can bring the ideas from machine intelligence, right, to ask a lot of very interesting questions that uh, relate to of scientific interest about, you know, what makes people, uh, uh, you know, what what's unique about individuals, what is common across languages, you know, how can we address a lot of very interesting questions, and you know, when you just have audio, how can we improve speech recognition? So again, I just wanted to point point you that there are data sets. So this is on the scientific side, right? Now let's uh, focus on the, uh, the the big part of uh, the talk on behavioral machine intelligence. Let me just watch my time. Okay, I'm doing all right. So as I said, right, the, the, the convergence, the confluence of from sensing to AI methodologies, uh, especially in the service of understanding, you know, uh, states and traits or constructs about people that are increasingly possible, especially inspired by, you know, um, needs in uh, mental and behavioral health, um, right? So what we are trying to do is like, can we bring um, sort of these types of uh, uh, approaches like machine intelligence approaches to seek a window into this psychological, physical and psychological state and behavior of humans and moving away from largely qualitative to quantitative approaches uh, thereby providing, you know, scale, broad accessibility, cost effectiveness, and so on. Uh, a big inspiration come, you know, but this is sort of, you know, understanding human behavior is not a new question, right? Like people have been trying to do this uh, for centuries, right? As long as we've been there and including in current commerce, right? User modeling, customer care, you know, uh, type of applications where we are trying to understand the behaviors through the signals people provide and uh, provides uh, services or uh, 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 support based on what we understand, right? Not just, you know, transactional, but go beyond that, right? This happens in, you know, in educational settings, in workplace, and, you know, a variety of application. So the question is like, you know, in this human behavioral understanding realm, what is the role of engineering and what can we do? Yeah. There's a, I think there's a chat. Uh, is it an immediate question that we need to ask? No, no, no. I, I just informed that the, for questions, please use chat. And, uh, so, no. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So one particular sort of realm uh, 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 that, that inspires us a lot is sort of the prevalence of these uh, uh, health conditions across the lifespan, right? From early development, like, you know, to sort of later in life, uh, which are sort of, either manifest, characterized, or treated, um, you know, at the level of behavioral sort of, you know, uh, differences and changes, right? For example, uh, an early um, uh, sort of uh, 
a, a developmental uh, condition like autism, right, is uh, neurogenetic in its origin, but it manifests itself as differences in social communication, affective behavior differences, and and a lot of uh, sort of you know, the screening and diagnostics relies on you know, markers of that. And of course, you know, response to treatment is also wants to ensure that changes are in the direction of uh, improving those conditions. Likewise, you know, later in life, you know, things like you know, dementia, the, the, you know, uh, such as due to Alzheimer's disease is again, uh, you know, manifests itself in behavioral differences in terms of you know, speech, language, movement, you know, affect and so on. So there's a large sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know inherent need, um, you know, in, in, in these domains. And these are all like have a lot of shared properties and they, you know, they have these behavioral sort of um, characteristics that are unique. And one of the questions we can ask is like, how can we bring our uh, the, this, this machine intelligence ecosystem to help one uh, understand these conditions in a way that is better stratified in sort of, you know, in, in, uh, in real world context, uh, how can we create, you know, tools to support sort of, you know, uh, personalized treatment, how can we know that these treatments are working, and there's a lot of possibilities there, right? So I'm going to draw a few examples, uh, our, you know, uh, you know, one of the domains where we started working in our lab early on uh, in, in this idea of mapping, sort of using, you know, uh, behavioral sort of signals like, you know, voice, uh, uh, language use, uh, interaction patterns, visual information, is to understand dyadic uh, 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 um, uh, dynamics, you know, interaction dynamics between people, especially when they're distress in the relationship, such as when uh, couples have trouble in their relationships, right? So we worked with uh, uh, clinical psychologists and uh, psychological uh, scientists um, to understand what are the things they were interested in. They were interested in characterizing affective dynamics, you know, th things like blame patterns and humor. And the way they did was, uh, you know, um, basically observe and model this uh, um, by human annotation. So the most obvious question uh, we, we were trying to do is, well, can we take the information signals and use machine learning to map it to the same things that the uh, clinicians are looking for? Right. So that was one example. Right. This is like uh, an example to show how what's done in the field. We can bring sort of, you know, uh, uh, computational tools to support that. We saw this uh, example of a child parent interaction. Right. In fact, uh, we also I mentioned autism as a domain. Right. So, for example, autism I mean, is uh, um, it's a highly prevalent uh, uh, condition, you know. In fact, uh, the numbers here should be one in 44 children in the U.S. Uh, 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 is diagnosed with ASD. It's characterized by difficulties in social communication, reciprocal behavior, stereotypic behavior, and so on. And it's 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 a big societal sort of you know uh, uh, need. So how do we? What are the? So it's a spectrum disorder, meaning. Um, the behavioral aspects that manifest are like varied across individuals, and they are also changing with development as children grow. Things are also changing because of that. So clinicians are looking for thing, differences in uh, patterns of, for example, turn-taking behavior differences, shared enjoyment, right? Is the the differences in patterns of how people, uh, if there's a you know a funny circumstance, are are, are they sort of uh, exchanging and displaying? Uh, enjoyment in the way that is uh, uh, what is expected. Uh, joint attention, do they pay you know, uh, attention both visually and in general multimodally to objects or uh, entities in the same way uh, and so on. So the question is like, can we bring computational sort of uh, tools to kind of characterize these conditions? So I will explain that later. So this is one possibility. In fact, we can take machine learning more the current sort of you know uh, uh, status in these domains is they have either uh, uh, surveys or reports uh, uh, based on interviews with uh, caregivers like parents or clinical observations, and they have you know these uh, uh, large instruments. Basically, the the sensing and uh, processing is done by a clinical expert. Now the question we can ask is, can we bring 
you know, in parallel, some of these tools that can process the interactions, you know, the speech, audio, visual, you know, behavior using, you know, audio processing, using computer vision, using, you know, other machine learning techniques to sort of bring scale, to bring efficiency and so on. In fact, we've shown that like, you know, one of the recent papers is to show how we can bring reinforcement learning ideas like uh, using Q-learning to make what uh, a clinical question to ask to guide uh, the 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 uh, clin clinician uh, to be more efficient and targeted toward that particular child's condition, right? Because you know, since it's a spectrum disorder, you know, not everything may be relevant. So you know, this this these kinds of tools can be in support of clinical sort of uh, practice. The other example I want to sort of to motivate, I want to show is from uh, treatment, right? Now, mental health I mentioned is like a huge. Um, need globally, one of the ways people sort of, you know, address mental health uh, uh, sort of support is through uh, psychotherapy. You know, you go to a, a therapist, you know, a clinician who will uh, try to understand um, uh, your uh, needs and try to support it. And there are various uh, different psych psychotherapeutic methodologies. You know, you may have heard about like things like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, motivational interviewing, and so on. So, but what is still not very well established is understanding what works for whom, how, and why, right? Uh, it, this is like humans are trying to uh, help other humans, but it's not clear, you know, uh, when what one does uh, is useful, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of theoretical work that goes on, but the question is like, uh, how can we really bring more quantitative objective ways for understanding this? So one of the lines of work that we've been doing is to see, can we bring machine intelligence ideas to understanding psychotherapy? For example, a constant empathy, the empathy expressed by uh, the therapist is supposed to, is uh, it's a good, indicator of the quality of the interaction and the outcomes, right? How do we know uh, how to sort of, you know, characterize that, right? It's perceived empathy. Can we use speech and language and visual cues to do that, right? And this is possible. And in fact, you know, uh, colleagues have done this. And, you know, in fact, this has been implemented uh, uh, in, in, in clinics. So I will touch upon this again. Yeah. This doesn't need to be, in, you know, in, in specific clinical conditions, but, you know, day to day, right? Like, you know, uh, especially in today's world, um, there's lots of stress and, you know, day, you know we are all trying to uh, manage that, that workplace at home and so on. So uh, can we create tools to support, you know, uh, individuals uh, using these sensors and machine learning and, you know, appropriate uh, response based on that? Uh, 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 say, for example, at workplace to uh, be, you know, more productive and healthy in, in doing our work at, at home to avoid conflicts and have stronger relationships. In fact, the, the, I'll, I'll show you some examples of this also later. So uh, in summary, what I want to indicate is there's a broad range of possibilities in daily life, you know, that, that, that where we can bring machine intelligence, you know, uh, and particularly behavioral machine intelligence to, to play to support uh, both basic science, but also its practical uh, applications. So we can think about now, how do we go about this, you know, from a more engineering perspective, or modeling human uh, states and traits, uh, say they are some latent sort of conditions, they're revealed through behavioral signals, through sort of, you know, you know, physiological signals or things that are available through, you know, uh, sensors that we can uh, 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 measure like speech, uh, audio, uh, or uh, uh, you know, visual signals with which then we can, you know, uh, map to uh, sort of various features or, uh, uh, and then draw inferences about the states that we are uh, interested in. This is kind of, you know, we can think about this as sort of, you know, in a, in a systems point of view, you know, there's some states dynamically evolving, there are some observations related to these states. And then, of course, you know, we can also imagine the control aspects also. We can intervene and these states can be changed toward desired state, right? And this kind of a systems theoretic way of thinking about it is something that is, you know, uh, uh, now uh, possible. So to operationalize this behavioral machine intelligence hence, you know, what do we need? We need sort of the nuts and bolts foundational signal processing methods that, you know, take uh, uh, sensors multimodal uh, from people from their environment 
and be able to you know make those signals useful and usable right all the things we do for you know signal enhancement filtering you know mapping it to you know driving features etc cetera, etc cetera. then we can bring all our machine learning based methods to map it to constructs that are meaningful for that particular domain right a clinician may be looking for a specific character uh, characterization of this data right i mentioned empathy right it seems like a very uh uh um, abstract construct right uh how is some empathy some something that is felt one feeling of putting themselves in the shoes of someone else that they're interacting with right how is this characterized right from the person who's interacting with right it's revealed through how you are behaving and acting right what are you saying how are you saying it how are you act and so that perceived empathy can be characterized from from the point of view of the observer or listener right so concept prediction of various sorts can be done in fact we don't need to stop there right we can go uh, we can bring mathematical models of these processes and mechanisms of how these things evolve what are the causal sort of uh, 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 nature of these kinds of behaviors right we can bring that to understand you no know, because we can have data that is not constrained by space or time you know we can have measurements uh, of a person at a workplace you know uh, and see how things evolve how people respond to sort of perturbations like an, an event that may be adverse that may have happened you know they may have had like some emergency that came up at work how do people regulate and manage we can measure and model these things of course as i mentioned you know with these kinds of methodological uh, advances we want to then translate them into diagnostics and intervention support right so already these things are happening right like you know in the last particularly 2 3 years you can think about like the advance every day we have hundreds of papers and uh, uh, tools you know uploaded to github and archive and, and so on in all realms of you know uh, uh, with data processing and modeling right the audio speech uh, vision physiology but what is very interesting and important in the domain is to map not just into these foundational blocks but to domain relevant behaviors like you know again using the uh, example of empathy or shared enjoyment these kinds of things that are relevant to specific domains right one particular angle here because of its human centered nature a lot of it has to kind of make sense to humans being in or on the loop right for example a medical uh, professional or uh, 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 an analyst and you know, who's like uh, looking at you know important data uh, at say a financial institution or you know national security so that judgments are important so the question is how can human and machine intelligence collaborate and cooperate and this is a very interesting exciting area uh, to work on so with that kind of a high level background i'm going to now jump into some examples of uh, illustrating some of these possibilities right so uh the first domain I'll, is uh what they broadly call in you know in in psychological and behavioral sciences as behavioral coding so typically uh what is done is if uh in a in a particular domain like say you know people interested in studying couples they have a methodology they know what are they looking for the characteristics like you know the you know affective states or blame patterns the data that they have is typically multimodal audio visual language you know they have coding and they try to observe and annotate right that's so we can think about this as a multimodal machine learning exercise right the same data we have and we try to map it to the same kind of constructs but now using you know signal processing machine learning methodology so you know relationship distress is one domain so i'll use that you know uh so what do experts do right they have elaborate co coding manuals where they describe and define these constructs for example here are some exam i know i hope you can see my uh, 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 mouse you know uh, pot, you know they watch the 20 minute of interaction between the couples and then they map it to uh, uh, many sort of uh, constructs like you know how much for example acceptance did uh, uh, the husband show right on a scale of 1 to 9 right there's a definition of that particular construct and the human observer uses this definition uh, uh, with the evidence in front of them the video that they watch and 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 come up with a rating right 
positive affect, negative affect, level of sadness, uh, use of humor. So this is sort of, uh, you know, done by humans, two or three annotators, they find, you know, annotator uh, uh, agreement, and then that becomes the basis for their uh, building their uh, theory, you know, and, and, and their treatment approach and so on. So one of the first things, you know, uh, we did like very simplistic, almost like uh, uh, 10 years ago or, uh, or more than 10 years ago, 14 years ago, is just translate that in a very simple uh, uh, machine learning exercise, right? We said, well, if we have the audio of the interaction dialogue between, you know, two people, can we process this and, and, and try to do the same behavioral coding? Sure enough, right? Just from audio, we could show and very simple machine learning, SVM, simple audio features, not even language. We could get uh, um, sort of uh, estimates of these various constructs they were looking for, right? Acceptance level, blame level, you know, uh, at the same uh, agreement statistics like that human annotator side, right? So people got very excited. Oh, the, you know, if you're able to use automated methods to uh, get this, can we sort of, you know, uh, this is very powerful because one doesn't need to watch like 20, 30 minute of video and hundreds of videos, but this could be yeah, made exciting. Of course, this led to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, natural development. Like, for example, in addition to audio, can we use also the language use? In fact, that's been studied a lot in, uh, in, in psychology. For example, they've shown that use of specific uh, uh, language patterns, like, you know, pronouns, you know, second pro a person pronoun you means you're blaming a lot. And, uh, and uh, using first person pronouns like we and us, less, less blaming, all these come naturally if you have these language models. This was all before, right? Uh, these large language models, even the not so large language models like you know, embeddings and so on. But even there, we could show that by multimodally combining different pieces of information, we can get at these uh, 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 um, sort of hidden states, right? These you know, states about you know, blame, you know, how blaming this, this person and so on. So this led to a lot of machine uh, sort of intelligence questions, right? Uh, how can we make this you know, um, um, multimodal context sensitive learning, right? What kind of architectures do we need to bring? So early on, you know, this led to uh, led us to uh, propose, uh, you know, BioLSTM and uh, type of architectures. This is like, you know, we're talking about like a long time ago when these things were still like emerging, uh, things uh, about, because often, you know, in these uh, uh, coding, right? There's a long document, right? So, say 30 minutes of a session that's happening, and experts are trying to come up with a global judgment, right? It's, you know, almost like uh, uh, so. What makes humans attend to specific portions of the interaction to come up with the overall judgment, right? So uh, we kind of, you know, initially, for example, say, and what are those salient instances? Can we use, you know, multiple instance learning type approaches now with various architectures, attention-based ones and so on, right? So now we can imagine, right, how questions from, inspired from the basic technologies can be brought to machine learning proxies, right? That's what I want to illustrate. Um, ratings, typically, you know, they're not like, you know, this is not a generally a, a class, you know, classification problem where you have a set of uh, classes which you are trying to map, sometimes it's a regression problem. Like, you know, you are rating things on a relative scale, like an ordinal scale. So can we come up with uh, ordinal regression models? Uh, then there are things that humans can't do easily. Uh, people have implicated that when two people are interacting, they, they may synchronize if they are positively sort of aligned and they may diverge if they are not, like so-called uh, entrainment uh, concept. Can we start to build computational models that can capture this? Uh, how can you now model observers and variations in people, how they process the data, right? Uh, models, realistic models of human observers and evaluators that we can bring into machine learning. You know, often, right, in machine learning, we try to get uh, agreement statistics and majority voting or some, some sort of thing typically to come up with consensus. But you know, in many of these cases, right, subjective uh, impressions of people, diversity is actually important. Can we actually build machine learning models that'll cover that? So these are some of the questions that you know in, were inspired by this domain, and you know we looked at. Uh, I'll just illustrate one. Uh, 
sort of, you know, can we identify sort of uh, uh, turns that would, um, uh, using multiple instance learning, uh, that would lead to the overall uh, judgment. And, you know, the, the, the way they did was to sort of, you know, again, create these bags of, you know, this was uh, done early on with diverse uh, density sort of uh, SVM, but now, you know, attention models, you know, others have followed up with like, you know, in our lab uh, with uh, better models, but a basic concept is, okay, we have data, which we can represent in some ways, you know, uh, vocal embeddings and uh, language embeddings. We have some ways of computing um, salient pro prototypes uh, and, and use those to ask these sort of, you know, uh, um, ways, instances that will explain to us about what led to the overall judgment. That's a basic idea. And, and we showed that that was very powerful. The other is uh, the example I wanted to just you know, uh, 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 illustrate is how can we model uh, interaction mechanisms and processes? So one theoretically very interesting concept is this whole notion of synchrony or entrainment and interaction, right? And people, have, uh, uh, researchers have said that more positively uh, um, uh, valence interaction is a higher degree of entrainment. Now the question is, how do we begin to model these things, right? Um, so, um, so we had again, we can think about representations and come up with some metric of similarity, which we can use as a computational proxy for uh, characterizing entrainment, and then use this similarity metric as a way to, uh, for example, explain uh, affective states, like, you know, uh, uh, can we use that as a feature to uh, predict affect? And, you know, uh, early work showed that, in fact, we can do this, you know, uh, it was more simplistic. We use vocal features in traditional ways and PCA type of embedding spaces. Now this has led to deep learning type, you know, uh, 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 extensions you can think about, you know, doing these, representations as, you know, embeddings uh, in the acoustic space, language space, and you can have distances between these embeddings as these uh, proxies for entrainment. And then we showed that, in fact, in a recent paper uh, in, in the transaction of effective computing, and these computational proxies of entrainment can predict things where they have been implicated, like, you know, couple therapy outcome or emotional bond and, you know, in suicide risk interviews and so on. So, Again, where computational methods can come uh, and help us understand things at detail. You know, I will skip this. Whatever we can do for you know uh, speech and language can be done multimodally with visual signals. You know, whether it's facial expressions, head movement, uh, body language, etc. So there's lots of uh, work in this area. So one final question is the relationship thing. You know, people always ask, okay, all this is good. Can you predict what's going to happen, right? Like, you know, so there was a retrospective work. We had uh, data from a clinical trial. So we knew after five years what happened to a relationship, whether it stayed the same, went bad, or improved. And, uh, and what uh, uh, our lab showed that by just using, you know, these uh, features drawn from the interaction data we had over the years, couple, you know, uh, samples we had, we could predict what is going to happen. Um, uh, uh, in fact, uh, much better than human experts, the behavioral codes are human experts, you know, uh, analyze and they use those to predict the outcome, 75% of the time, just the audio features could do it, you know, as well. And together, you know, they, they, they gave the best result, meaning that these data have complementary information that may be even be missed by this behavioral coding that human experts do. So there's lots of you know, interesting things beyond science to actually you know, have predictive value. So what happened then, this kind of led to new ways of thinking about, can we do this prospectively, you know, in sort of, uh, you know, just analysis after things have happened. And so, uh, one of the things that uh, we did was, you know, can we use sensors and, you know, measurements in real world to predict something that it's upcoming. So, um, and so they, you know, uh, former lab members, you know, Theodora, uh, Spari and, you know, Adi Timmons, they, you know, rigged up, you know, sensors on people and they, you know, could predict conflict at home <clears throat> uh, by using a variety of multimodal sensors using, you know, uh, 
electrodermal activity, you know, heart rate variability, context where they are, uh, measures of synchrony, uh, language use, and about 80, 85% of the time, they can uh, predict an upcoming uh, conflict, you know, from these signals, uh, even better than what the self-report of the, how their day was going from the people. And, and in fact, they are trying to use de device means for uh, supporting their, uh, you know, intervening conflicts before they happen. You know, they have, in fact, have a startup on this too. Uh, uh, this also led to a large study in uh, um, uh, workplace, uh, as we know, right, like, you know, particularly in the last three years of pandemic and so on, a lot of, you know, uh, changes in how work is done, uh, especially, you know, think about a, a high stakes workplace, like, like a hospital environment and people like nurses and doctors, right? So we had a large study of about 400 uh, clinical uh, workers, you know, doctors, nurses, and so on, with a variety of sensors, you know, physiological sensors, audio sensor, uh, digital activity, uh, 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 surveys from them. And to be able to map these kinds of behavioral constructs using machine learning, you know, it richly varying in time and, uh, and in space. So very unique data set, you know, which we have released. Um, I just wanted to highlight this so people who are interested in bringing machine intelligence ideas to processing these very complex uh, uh, data from uh, people and a lot of, you know, supporting metadata, uh, both from nurses and medical residents and teams. Um, and so we could have data like this, like sleep data, uh, Fitbit data, uh, you know, heart rate, uh, audio, uh, you know, social interactions, et cetera. Um, so, and let me just give you a couple of insights that, you know, we, uh, questions we can ask, for example, uh, nurses work 12, hour, you know, uh, uh, 24 hours, right? Some work night shifts, some work day shifts. We wanted to see behavioral sort of differences um, between day and night shift people. Uh, we showed that you know, day shift workers maintain regular sleep patterns, uh, both work and non-work days, but not night shift people. Their non-work days are also screwed up so that their health, it impacts their health. Sleep is an important thing. So we have to think about now how we can support. Uh, uh, this is from their data. In fact, we can show, dig deeper and show that the circadian rhythm, right? Like, you know, we have a particular rhythm, uh, uh, what's called the circadian rhythm, say, in our heart rate patterns. So the top panel is um, people who did day shift, people in the night shift had, you know, uh, disturbed circadian rhythm. So all these kinds of data now can be modeled that, you know, in, in, in great detail, that's not possible before with this confluence of sensing, signal processing, machine learning, and hopefully help, you know, provide interventions uh, at, at workplace. This is, I just want to illustrate this. So, if it, you know, and the data are all released and so people can use. So we can, in fact, use um, machine learning for predictive modeling, right? We know that positive events support positive events that are upcoming. Negative events can increase negative affect anxiety. And we showed that we can create embeddings of these multimodal data, behavioral, physiological data to predict upcoming events based on what's going on uh, in our circumstance. Right? So a lot of these things are possible. Right? So I know I'm coming close to time. The next two examples I want to kind of quickly illustrate is autism we referred to. I said it's a very prevalent condition, uh, difficulties in social communication. Again, what role can machine uh, intelligence, behavioral machine intelligence play? You know, uh, the assessment is typically done, you know, by clinical experts by looking at language interaction stereotype behaviors. This is their rubric, right? One can imagine uh, coming up with sort of tools that can support this, right? For example, looking at prosody, the musicality in our speech is is atypical in in, in 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 people with autism, right? So it's qualitatively described like like a slow, rapid, jerky, or irregular rhythm, and so on. People who do speech processing, you know, it's easy. They kind of have uh, features that can characterize these things, like you know, pitch and intensity and duration, and so on. And sure enough, right? We showed that. Uh, these kinds of automatically extracted features sort of correspond to qualitatively descri describe child's prosody. But what we get also showed that in that analysis, we can also see that the prosody of the interacting person here, the psychologist, 
also varied based on the severity of the child they're interacting with. So meaning people are changing their behavior in conjunction with the status, the health status of the person they're interacting with here, the child that they are trying to diagnose. In fact, we showed that by using just the speech and data from the psychologist, we can predict the severity rating of the child that they're interacting with, right? So here's a role that machine intelligence can play, right? It can model the interaction dynamics and so on to complement just the human-derived, expert-derived judgments. So that was an insight. In fact, the synchrony work, uh, had we just had a paper recently by using the more recent, you know, uh, uh, machine learning methods, uh, audio uh, embeddings uh, from speech, language embeddings, and so on to create these synchrony measures and show that, you know, we can use synchrony or differences in how people interact as a way to, as a biomarker for autism diagnosis. Uh, so it's very useful. What we can do for speech and language can be done for facial expressions. Again, it's also considered atypical. We can model um, facial from a scientific point of view. We've shown that complexity differences in how various parts of uh, the face and uh, visual uh, movements are coordinated is different. We can quantify that and use it as a biomarker. And in fact, we showed that uh, this kind of cross-modal coordination uh, was greater when uh, sort of, you know, uh, again, non-AST children and between sort of, you know, face and voice and different portions of the uh, face. But when you have uh, children who are, have uh, uh, autism, they, this coordination was sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, less. And it became even worse when they're in a social circumstance. So all these can be sort of, you know, not easily be done with just human annotators, but can be computationally captured and modeled these mechanisms. So I just want to illustrate, not only can we do things like that are uh, this direct, okay, can we take human derived specified constructs and create a machine learning equivalent, but we can go further using machine learning. That's what I'm trying to uh, illustrate here. So a lot of opportunities uh, for rich multimodal. So, I'll quickly skip this, you know, the psychotherapy. Again, we, sh we, we showed that we can now uh, process the data interaction, you know, audio, language, and video data. Uh, we can create pipelines using you know, existing methodologies and speech recognition and speaker diarization with which we can sort of, you know, uh, map data to codes. For example, I mentioned empathy. In fact, this, is, this was done and it's been used in clinics, but more sophisticated machine intelligence methods out there growing, right? How can we do end-to-end -end system just go directly from audio or video recording to constructs of interest? And these things are being sort of, you know, possible. Uh, for example, we showed that by combining language with prosodic information can provide better, improved sort of, you know, mapping of constructs like empathy, right? And so I'll, I'll, I'll skip this. Uh, the final sort of you know uh, example I want to give is you know we are from Los Angeles Hollywood, uh, in uh, drawn from social sciences right same kind of machine intelligence methods can it help us in other domains right we talked about clinical domain now, so especially you know one question that we we know that the media that we are creating and using and consuming is just across platforms is huge, entertainment sports news everything right. One of the things that, you know, uh, questions that we asked was, can we understand, you know, inclusive representation? So one of the first questions that we, you know, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we said, can we use these machine learning and machine AI ideas to understand how people are seen and represented in, you know, media, right? For example, movies. So we started with how are women seen and heard, right? Um, of course, you know, you can translate that to uh, standard machine learning things we can track, uh, um, who is whom, uh, and then we can say how much they are seen, how much they are heard, and be sure that only, you know, even in movies that are led by female leads, they only get about third of the screen time and speaking time, right? Uh, means they also sort of, you know, they're paid less, but the movies make as much or more money. So these kinds of bringing sort of these kind, uh, you know, machine learning ideas to domains that were, weren't 
you know, these are all like, you know, more media studies and, you know, uh, in, 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 uh, they can play an important role. In fact, another study of advertisements, you know, with Google, we showed that uh, um, using uh, all these machine learning ideas, uh, understanding representations that having parity, right, uh, means it's actually makes business sense. So again, uh, the role of machine learning is there even in, um, you know, social sciences. Uh, one funny sort of observation we, we you know we made I, wouldn't have been possible without these ideas is when no one is talking always, you know, majority of the time we saw male faces on screen. When males were talking, of course, they were seen. But when females, you know, uh, were talking, again, we see most of the time uh, guys were on the on, on on focus. So a lot of these kinds of in in insights can be derived using this idea. Same thing you can do with text processing and so on. I'll skip that. So um, I had like you know a bunch of slides. I think I'm out of time. Uh, one thing I want to make right. We are talking about something that is very human centered, right? Very. Uh, this, you know, when we are talking about humans, right, like you know, one of the important things we need to worry about is like, how do we create these technologies, machine intelligence to be trustworthy, right? It's a very loaded term. It has, it means a lot, right? You know, from a, uh, um, it, uh, whether what we are building is explainable, transparent, robust, but also things that are very human, like, is it inclusive? It, is it like, uh, 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 does it provide robust experiences for everyone across all contexts? Uh, does it respect privacy, right? safeguard protected information when it is needed? Is it safe? You know, is it uh, pr uh, protected from vulnerable uh, and malicious attacks? You know, um, and so this is a very exciting area uh, of work that's happening. You know, uh, in in these domains, I, I don't have time, but I'll share the slides. You know, I wanted to share uh, some work on how we can. Uh, both attack and protect against you know specific things. For example, from speech or visual data, we can get a lot of different pieces of information, right, about their safe affective state. That's maybe the target. But we also can get a lot of private things about their health status, about their gender, and so on. We might want to only uh, show or reveal some aspects, but not other aspects. How do we create machine intelligence techniques that will respect these kinds of things? Uh, so these are questions that people are asking. So I will um, skip that portion, but I want to underscore that this is like a very exciting uh, area that we need to work on. Uh, so in summary, right, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, this is a very important area, has a lot of uh, promise and potential, but there are a lot of challenges we need to address, you know, everything from getting the right data, processing in the right way, but also doing it in a very thoughtful manner, right? with all the people, stakeholders involved, you know, respecting this uh, big aspect of trustworthiness. Uh, shared resources are important, right? I, you know, put some of the things that, you know, I talked about in this particular talk, so people, if they're interested, they can go download, use it. Uh, in summary, right, I hope I kind of conveyed that uh, the human-centered machine intelligence has a lot of possibilities that help us do things that we know how to do, but more efficiently, consistently, robustly, but also make us do things, you know, uh, discover new ideas about us humans and hopefully translate that to useful uh, uh, constructs for supporting diagnostics, interventions, and treatments across domains, not just in health. So thank you so much for listening to me and all my collaborators and colleagues. Okay, thank you very much, Sri. You were exactly on time. And uh, do, do you have any questions? Uh, um... With the audience, we have three minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you have any questions, you have one minute to write it down until I do a couple of questions or comments I may have. So feel free to write your questions. Okay, thank you very much. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to have a lot of ideas for your master thesis uh, from this application domains. Now, one of my questions I have many things we could discuss for hours but one of my question is uh, kind of implicitly associated to trustworthiness that you said in, in the last slide and it's mostly related to, to robustness for example in the case of that let's take the example of dyadic interactions in couple therapy uh, how are these six classes uh, uh, like acceptance and blame affected by the cultural background of the users or even age for example the empathy expressed between a couple in their 30s is 
at least in Greece, is totally different from the empathy expressed in the, in the 60s. So, uh, for example, in, in behavioral signals, we have seen that many times, uh, you know, detecting anger in, in, in call center analytics uh, between different languages is, is totally dependent on, on the cultural background. So my question is, are there any particular, you know, good practices for, for measuring and uh, taking care of that? uh dependence on the cultural background language the age or all, 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 all these attributes absolutely that's a it's a very very important question uh Tarari. i i think you know some of these sort of factors that may influence you know uh, that's what i meant by the twin goals of you know one of the dimensions of variability is of interest right for example affective variability but mm -hmm. there may be other dimensions of variability that can influence this both interfere also enhance, for example, uh, you said like, you know, demographic traits like age and uh, gender expression and uh, your uh, linguistic background and, you know, where you are, uh, uh, your cultural sort of, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, background. Some of those are sort of, you know, um, we can encode them, some of them are latent. So one of the big challenges is like, you know, where if these factors are explicitly needed or interest, you know, we can characterize them, we will try to others, we might want to think about them as, you know, sort of almost like latent factor type things and try to uh, include them in joint modeling or disentangle them, or at least account for them in interpreting and explaining, especially you know, the inferences we draw and, and the actions we take based on the inference. For example, right, like for example, you know, uh, dyadic interactions and the manner of interactions of shared enjoyment uh, would be very different, for example, how people express and show um, their uh, their joy, for example, right, uh, through behavioral cues. Or it may be a circumstance, they may they may be different, depending on the register difference, right, they're talking to a superior, say, uh, they may not, like, you know, be overtly sort of expressive about uh, things. Mm -hmm. So this contextual elements of, which includes social context, cultural context, they need to be brought into understanding these and bringing sort of the machine learning uh, tools to shine light on that is going to be extremely important. We don't know exactly how to do this, except for specific use cases where we kind of have some of the meta information. Um, but that that is a great opportunity. So, uh, and people have shown some of the impact of the, the how that might influence. Uh, uh, the other is like, how do we kind of disentangle and take care of it and remove, use those as bias terms. Little bit of work is happening there uh, in disentangling these factors and uh, debiasing. But I think that's one of the big areas uh, that needs a lot of work in this as more richer data is coming forth that from real world circumstances. Uh, that's far, right? A lot of the work in, you know, they have been yeah. more contrived data. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's a very okay, good great. question. So, yeah. Do you have any other questions? Guess not. I, I will share the slides. If people yeah, that, that, that would be great. Yeah. I'm going to and share people the can slides. write to write to me uh, if uh, questions come up and you know uh, anytime thank you thank you very much again um, thank you all for being here and thank you Sri again uh, Lord, looking forward to seeing you uh, sometime soon uh, bye thank you very much thanks so much thanks so much have a great thanks. day at, at LA bye thank you bye bye, -bye.